Hi there, my name is Matthew Hoke. I teach at Auburn University in the United States and my presentation for this year's ISME Forum is Training the Voice Teachers of Tomorrow, a function-based approach to 20th century pedagogy. Our point of departure. In the world of voice pedagogy, the events of the last two decades can only be described as transformational. Interdisciplinary collaborations with speech language pathologists, otolaryngologists, and voice scientists have yielded new research that has unraveled many of the wonders and mysteries of the singing voice. 21st century voice teachers are now educated in biomechanics, psychoacoustics, and motor learning theory, and they can practically apply these scientific concepts in the Applied Voice Studio. In this evidence-based era, is there still room for the old school bel canto method that has been passed down for centuries by the Italian masters, teachers to their pupils? Are the concepts and methods of Garcia, Marchese, and Lamperti still relevant and useful? This presentation explores the common ground that exists between the old Italian school of singing and the modern era, arguing that science has affirmed many of the concepts that originated in the bel canto era. After a brief overview of the history of voice pedagogy, specific bel canto concepts will be discussed within the context of current evidence-based research and analyzed from a scientific perspective. I will argue that voice pedagogues from all eras have used the knowledge that existed in their time to strive for A, the most efficient vocal production possible, to B, build the technical skills necessary to C, artistically sing a scientific style or repertoire. This presentation will conclude with an opportunity for questions and discussion. And here I have a painting that is a very famous painting that you might recognize by Paul Gauguin. It's called, Where Do We Come From? What Are We and Where Are We Going? And I thought that's a good subtitle for this presentation as well. So part one is, where do we come from? In the beginnings of voice pedagogy, it is difficult to pinpoint. It is safe to say that humans have been singing since prehistoric times, the thinkers of the ancient Greek world, such as Plato, Aristotle wrote about the importance of singing as part of a complete humanistic education. Likewise, the Judeo-Christian writings of the Old Tanakh Old Testament also include passages in the books of Exodus, Judges, Second Chronicles, and Ecclesiastes, and most important, the 150 Psalms of David that are intended to be sung. Soon after the establishment of the early Roman Catholic Church, an official school of singing, presumably a choir school, was founded by Pope Sylvester in Rome for the purpose of training young singers for liturgical services. Thus, voice pedagogy must have existed in some form, but unfortunately there are no writings that have been preserved from this era that outline a specific pedagogic strategy or approach. During the Renaissance, however, selected pedagogic works began to appear in writing. Hurst Günther proposes that the first book of singing was the German scholar Konrad von Zabern, De modo cantati colorum cantum in 1474. Karen Zell in 2005 and Richard Miller in 2007, in their attempts to survey the early history of the singing voice pedagogy, also list Franchinus Scafurius, Benin de Basili, Maffei, Zacconi, and Giulio Caccini as important early figures. Nicola Porpora was perhaps the most important singing teacher of the early 18th century, but unfortunately he wrote little. Corpora's reputation rests almost entirely upon his outstanding legacy of successful pupils, including the castrati Cavalieri, Farinelli, as well as the female sopranos Regina Mignotti and Caterina Gabrielli. Pier Francesco Tosi wrote our first um, landmark treatise in the, in the history of voice pedagogy entitled Observations on the Florid Song. Tosi was an Italian constrato, composer, and writer of music. He is best known for his early treatise, Opigni, Opinioni, excuse me, De Contoni Antichi e Moderni, in 1723, which is one of the first voice pedagogy treatises to have been preserved in its entirety. In 1743, 20 years after it was written, the treatise was published in English as Observations on the Florid Song, and this is how we usually remember it. Still available in print, Tosi's work was especially valuable for its catalog of various Baroque ornaments utilized by singers at the time. This tendency to focus on style, execution, and the literature as opposed to confronting the vocal technique and voice production directly is a hallmark that spans most of the earliest treatises on singing voice pedagogy. 
Tozi was also primarily concerned with castrati. He is, however, the most agreed upon starting point for scholars of historical voice pedagogy. During these early years, the art of singing was passed down through a master apprentice system from teacher to student, who then later became teachers themselves. Teachers claimed to have descended from a particular teacher or school of singing. Even contrasting techniques claim to be part of the same heritage or system. This tradition is of course called bel canto. So what is bel canto? It's one of the most ubiquitous terms in voice pedagogy, and it literally means beautiful singing in Italian. Bel canto, however, is a broad concept that is difficult to grasp in large part due to the multifarious nature of the definition itself. The term is at once an aesthetic concept and a tonal preference, which varies according to context and style period, a reference to flexible and florid singing, a specific operatic repertory, and a school of voice pedagogy. In addition, bel canto can mean different things depending on the social historical context of the time period in question. And in my book, A Dictionary for the Modern Singer, which I'm not going to read for you, but I wanted to, to talk about the, my attempt to get at the core of what this slippery term bel canto is. You're welcome to pause this video and read this in its entirety. Stark also, from his book, Bel Canto, A History of Vocal Pedagogy, offers his own definition. And so does Richard Miller, who's somewhat cynical about the term bel canto because um, he views it as not having a specific meaning, which he's kind of right about. Um, but Miller absolutely champions the International Italian School of Singing and particularly the breathing approach of the International Italian School. Lamperti is another touchstone we have to this Italian school of singing. He has, uh, his maxims are published in a book called Vocal Wisdom. That's a very famous book. And he also is in favor of this um, modern bel canto approach and systematizing something that is hard to systematize. The International Italian School of Singing. Bel canto pedagogy should not be thought of as something that is merely historical. Bel canto traditions, now labeled by many thanks to Richard Miller as the International Italian School of Voice Pedagogy, persisted throughout the 20th century and into the present day practice. In 21st century, scientifically informed or fact-based singing teachers coexist somewhat peacefully alongside those who identify as old fashioned teachers from the bel canto tradition. And still more singing teachers draw from both traditions in their pedagogy. Methodologies. Skill acquisition voiced pedagogy was a hallmark of the 19th century. These names, which are familiar to us through their method books, such as the Kai, Concone, Ponafka, Marchesi, were primarily interested in skill building to sing a very specific kind of repertoire. And this is how the classical vocalese really got its origin. Classical vocaleses were not designed to teach you how to belt musical theater or to sing as a chorister. They were designed to help you get the flexibility and, and um, uh, agility that you need to sing the bel canto Italian um, operatic repertoire. Manuel Garcia II, Manuel Garcia the Younger, was from a very famous family of singing teachers. Um, his father was a famous tenor, and he was also the sister of Martilda Marchese um, and Pauline Bayardo Garcia. Um, but he's credited with the beginning of the fact-based era of voice pedagogy and was credited as the inventor of the first laryngoscope. Bel Canto has kept having this master apprentice system, which was focused on skill-based um, singing and not so much focused on anatomy and physiology and voice science until a very important year of the 20th century, and that is 1967. In this year, Venard's Singing, the Mechanism and the Technique and um, was published, and uh, along with Ralph Appleman's Science of Vocal Pedagogy, Venard was a famous singing teacher from the University of Southern California. Appleman was a famous singing teacher from Indiana University. And these two really tried to get at the heart of biomechanics and acoustics in a new way. Um, these, Bernard's book in particular was the most enduring um, book on voice pedagogy until Richard Miller's landmark, The Structure of Singing, was published in 1986. And we have two families or two pillars of voice pedagogy that emerged during this time. 
biomechanics and acoustics. And the biomechanic teachers were really these five, the most important. Mary Beth Dame, who published Dynamics of the Singing Voice, James McKinney, The Diagnosis and Correction of Vocal Faults, Richard Miller, The Structure of Singing, Barbara Dosher, The Functional Unity of the Singing Voice, and Scott McCoy, Your Voice and Inside View. Um, to be fair, Scott McCoy um, especially goes into a lot of acoustics as well. Richard Miller and the Structure of Singing really broke down his, uh, his method for voice pedagogy in a more systematic way than pedagogues had done before him. He says that to teach voice, we really need to address all of these components. So a Richard Miller warm-up will systematically work its way through onset and release, breath management, agility and flexibility, resonance, vowel breathing, resonance, and so on. Um, it's a very helpful book to people who are new to voice teaching. Um, when I um, sang three doctoral recitals, then all of a sudden had my first college position, Miller's book was really helpful to the beginning pedagogue. And I find most useful his um, inclusion of specific exercises to do to work on each of these categories. And also he explains what's happening physiologically. We also have the second pillar emerging during this time, which is acoustic theory. Burden Coffin had the first stab at this with his Sounds of Singing Vocal Techniques and Vowel Pitch Chart, where he recommended a slightly different vowel formation depending on where you are in the system. He was the first voice pedagogue to get to the heart of um, that performance and how to tune different vowels to different acoustic um, areas of your voice. Johann Sundberg has the acoustics of the singing voice in 1977, and Belcanto um, published another important book, Overtones of Belcanto, in 1980. Johann Sundberg has the science of the singing voice in 1989. And more recently, in the 21st century, Ken Bozeman and Ian Howell have um, made further attempts to make acoustics more practical. Bozeman's devoted the latter half of his career to making acoustics as accessible as possible. Ian Howell is um, less accessible but brilliant, more of a theorist, and he's um, uh, his uh, concepts of, particularly his concepts of absolute spectral tone color, um, ASTC as it's abbreviated, um, is really uh, paving some new interesting paths into the world of um, acoustics and the singing voice. And the other important advent that we have in the 20th century that really leads us toward a function-based approach to singing is that of vocology. And the definition of vocology, which was coined by Ingo Tietze, is the science and practice of voice habilitation. So if we think of um, audiology as being the science of hearing, um, vocology is a partner across, we look here from audiology to vocology. So if we have voice science here, hearing science, Autology, laryngology, vocology, audiology. Ingo has never trademarked this term. He does not want to do that. He wants this to eventually be in Merriam-Webster as its own discipline that stands alongside as a parallel of audiology. I got the privilege of studying with Dr. Tietz for three summers at the National Center for Voice and Speech, the Summer Vocology Institute in beautiful Salt Lake City. And it was just a wonderful experience that transformed my pedagogy and really um, made me a proponent and believer of a function-based approach to singing. So the Summer Vocology Institute has three blocks of um, graduate level um, voice pedagogy, which is also dovetailed with voice science and the vocal health professions. You study principles of voice production for three credits in block one, then you have voice habilitation and instrumentation in block two, and in block three you have voice for performers, which applies it to the performing voice. It is a very intense and fulfilling program. Ingo Tietze in 1999 published an article of his five favorite vocal warmups. And these are significant because they are clearly not um, geared toward a specific repertoire like the traditional skill acquisition based works of Vakai and Concone and Marchese. These are works that are solely based toward vocal function and toward the efficiency of voice. So these activities here are a great way to warm up your voice through lip trills, octave glides. He's a big, um, 
a proponent, the founder really of the semi occluded vocal tract techniques like singing through a straw. And what's wonderful about these exercises is they prepare you to sing any repertoire. They will warm you up equally well for music theater, for rock and roll, for classical singing, um, because they are purely based on function and completely divorced from a specific kind of repertoire. Here's one of my favorite pictures, Ingo Tietze's doing straw phonation with the famous opera singer, Renee Fleming. Untangling exceptional vocal skills and mapping a blueprint for the future. What if these vocal skills for function-based singing can apply beyond our traditional concept of what singing is? We can have shouting, which theater voice users do all the time. We have duration of vocalization, so people who give long speeches, amplified versus unamplified singing. The concepts of classical singing versus contemporary commercial singing or CCM, um, those are gradually being abandoned in favor of, oh, I teach amplified singing, I teach unamplified singing, which might make a lot more sense um, to move forward that way rather than pigeonholing ourselves into particular repertoire. Um, also voice impersonation, mimicking the people who do voiceovers, that's an exceptional vocal loop vocal use, screaming or primal sound making um, requires a technique behind it in order to do that safely. So where are we now? We're in an age of evidence-based voice pedagogy and evidence-based teachers give instructions that are factual in nature, biomechanically and acoustically speaking. So the idea of using imagery would not be in the province of an evidence-based voice teacher. Pretend you're singing out of your unicorn horn or your third eye, that's obviously not a evidence-based approach to singing. Sing from your diaphragm is one of my favorites because the diaphragm is a muscle of inhalation. So obviously you're not singing while you inhale. And in addition to being fact-based in what they teach students and using, describing what really happens physiologically, they work well as, they make an effort to form relationships with speech language pathologists and other vocal health professionals, and they stay abreast of current research. The missing mind, the third pillar of voice pedagogy. This is a very new field that's still emerging, emerging but um, obviously body awareness and psychology are huge elements of what it takes to be um, any kind of performer and a, a singer in particular. These are two books recently that have come out that really address both the mind and the body in unique ways. You have The Musician's Mind by Lynn Helding and So You Wanna Sing with Awareness, which is from the Nat So You Wanna Sing series. I edited this book with a variety of different contributors on different kinds of body methods, Feldenkrais, Alexander, um, yoga. Um, really beneficial to people who wanna dip their feet in the waters and try out a variety of approaches. So where are we going? We seek to build a bridge between practice and scholarship. We wanna find ways for the two communities, so the educators and the performers to work together and find synergy and the voice scientists. And we want to establish a function-based voice pedagogy that applies to all styles and genres. And we're working toward a meta theory which combines acoustics, bioenergetics, motor learning principles, skill acquisition and fatigue resistance, psychology and cognition, awareness and mindfulness, language, theatrical skills, musicianship, repertoire, history and style, it's all important. Unfortunately, we could not meet together in Finland. Um, was really looking forward to this trip, but please contact me at mrh0032 at auburn.edu if you would like to continue this discussion. Um, thank you so very much and um, have a wonderful remainder of your virtual conference.